pop filters being weird. All right, I got it. Okay, so, wait, mic's a little far away. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so, hi there. Uh, this is Adam from the Arcane Mystery Tour. I am the DM, and uh, the DM. That's pretty much all I do on the podcast. Um, usually, I go to close. Uh, but uh, as as some of you might know, um, all four of the members of the Arcane Mystery Tour live in Florida, which is currently being hit by, uh, or are currently on path to be hit by uh, uh, Hurricane Irma. Uh, one of our players lives in South Florida. The other two live in the other three live in the uh, Central Florida area. But we're all in areas that are most likely going to be hit. Thankfully, uh, most of us aren't evacuating, but we will be losing power during this time. So, unfortunately, the usual episode that we'll be playing this week right here is not going to be playing. Uh, so, instead, uh, I was asked to record a little apology thing. Uh, like, our director team decided that we should record at least something to give you guys on the feed. Something to know about, like, what happened and something to at least put something in there for the week. So that it's not just uh, dead space for those of you lucky enough to not be in the, that situation. Um, I'm deciding to take it a little further. And I want to talk to you guys as a DM. Just a sort of a one-on-one, -on -one, you and me sort of thing. Uh, and Chris, who's probably editing this or something. Um, but the uh, but something I wanted to, to go over was the the way that you DM is something that's very interesting. And it changes between who does it and who doesn't do it. So I wanted to try to talk about um, DMing and uh, maybe talk about... Uh, so, uh, because I am a DM, uh, my roommates asked me if I could write them a D&D &D campaign for this uh, weekend. Because we're going to be stuck in, the, in, in our apartment, uh, boarded up, uh, cans of food, and lots of alcohol. Because, yeah, that's how, you, that's how you get through a hurricane in Florida. Um, uh, they asked me to write a D&D &D campaign or session just to do a little one shot uh, to give us something to do because we you, you end up spending a lot of time in these sort of situations um, just sitting around doing nothing without power. Uh, thankfully, D&D &D doesn't require a lot of power. You can do it with pencils and paper and no power whatsoever and you'll still be fine. Um, so that's what I, I, I wanted to talk to you about today. Basically, I wanted uh, none of this is scripted, by the way, so I'm sorry if it's a little, a little bit rambly and a little bit... Um, not as well thought out as it could be. I know that you're used to hearing me talk about things that I have at least written down in, in part thought, but this is something I wanted to do. We're going to give you guys something as an apology for us not being able to get stuff ready in time. Um, cause it sucks. <laughs> and it's not like, I, I hope you understand where we really can't get things out. Um, because yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's a rough situation the uh so first of all uh dming big thing uh about d d and d is that the dm is your okay first first lesson or first uh, tip um if you are a dm or a player this applies to you this is something that you can keep in mind the dm is your friend and the dm is the extra party member that never speaks because the dm wants the party to win as much as they can. Now, there are some DMs out there that are kind of cruel and want to just kind of and, and enjoy the idea of like occasionally TPKing their party. But for the most part, your DM is going to try his best to make sure or her best to make sure that or their best to make sure <laughs> that the uh, the players are given a challenge that is both um, difficult to overcome, but realistic enough for them to beat in terms of their skill level. It might require a lot of work, but you give them something that they can actually beat, and you want to try as much as you can to give that sensation of accomplishment, that sensation of feeling like, wow, we overcame this awesome thing. We're so cool. Look at us go. Not, wow, the DM's a dick, and he made us spend 40 minutes trying to figure out a riddle, which I've done before, and it sucked because you feel like the worst person in the world, and you feel bad about your players not getting things because you wonder what you did wrong. And then you have to kind of just have that argument with them. Sometimes, like sometimes they like say like this is bad, and you're like trying to say like no, it's not bad. I'm just like, uh. you know, and you, you, it's it's sort of that awkward state. But the, if you are a player and you're wondering, does the DM hate me? The DM 
should be your friend. And I would bring up that concern. I, I would absolutely bring up that concern to him. If you feel like the DM is... So something that I've started doing um, the past year or so, so a little bit after I started doing DMing, um, is I would ask, and this is from a good friend of mine, Taylor, who would, when he was DMing, he would do the same thing, and I thought it was really good, um, is he would ask the party what they liked about the session, what they didn't like about the session. And that's important because it gives you an idea of what is working for your players and what isn't working for your players. A lot of uh, DMs will come to the table with their story in mind, present it, have the players go through it, and that'll be it. That'll be the, the extent of their interaction, which can be good. And it adds an element of like surprise, adds an element to like this, the, uh, the, uh, the, the professionalism of the table, I guess you could call it. Um, which is good. I think it's really good for D and D to have that because it, it makes it makes it feel more legit. <laughs> like, uh, have you ever played a really poorly made indie game and like you can tell because the UI isn't that great and the particles are weird or there isn't a lot of stuff. It's like not very. There's not a lot of polish or um, frills and bells and whistles and things like that to make it look like the, oh this is a finished working product. There's lighting and stuff. All that's th that's. That's something that D&D kind of has to struggle with making sure doesn't happen, unlike other other mediums, or like other mediums has to struggle. But in its own way, that's, I guess, part of it is the, the way that the story ends up. It should all feel very concrete and solid. So a lot of DMs will come, they'll do that, and then they'll go off and they'll write the next session. Or they'll have the whole thing written out in advance. A lot of DMs will do that. Um, some DMs, and I, I think a lot more the more experienced DMs you find... Um, we'll write more um, ideas, like word, not not word trees, but like word bubbles and like thoughts and like just um, this is an idea that I want them to do. Here's how I would kind of like do it, um, but they won't set anything in concrete. Like this is what they're doing. This is where they're going. This is what is happening, um, because they're able to give, bring that extra level of improvisation to the table because they're able to go with the flow. Um, I personally have a big tr problem with that still. Uh, I'm still very inexperienced and new when it comes to DMD, D and D DMing as a player. I'm fine, but as a DM, it's, it's a different challenge entirely. Um, because you have to account for so many elements and variables and players and player think, which, which can be hard, but is, is kind of my entire career anyway. Um, so if you are looking to DM, Talk to your players. Ask them what they're doing. Like, ask them how they feel about things after the fact. Try not to do it in the middle of the session. It makes it weird. After the fact, ask them about how they felt it went. Did they feel satisfied? Did they feel like it was a good challenge? Not, did it go exactly as you wanted it to, but was it fun? Because that's, that's a big part of it, is that you want to make sure it's a fun experience. And as a player, you should be giving your DM the, as much information as you can. Um, and try to steer him. Don't just criticize, but try to steer him in a direction that you think would benefit the both of you. So your DM really likes this idea of um, mummies in your game, let's say. Um, trying to think of the scenario on the spot, so forgive me if it takes a bit to get through. Um, he really likes mummies in your game, but you hate mummies for whatever reason. Not not like they, they horrify you or like they, they make you like actually... Like, like, they, like, it's an actual phobia of yours because that's something your DM should never be doing. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But um, definitely, you know, let him know that, like, those sort of settings don't excite you as a player. And, you know, if he says, well, I want to write this story, then it may be time to talk about the idea of not being a group anymore and or you exiting the group to some capacity. Because if you don't enjoy being there, if you're not enjoying the story, why are you there? Why are you playing? Um, why why is your DM spending time writing it? It's an insult to you and to the DM. It's an insult to the other players at the table who are trying to take this as seriously as they can for you to do that. By the way, I have a beer, so you might hear me drinking. Hopefully not. I think I have my mic calibrated so it doesn't show up, but it is, uh, who knows. But that's what the breaks are going to be for because I need a beer. Um the uh so the the b 
big thing that comes in after that, uh, kind of leading off that topic that we talked about earlier, uh, player comfort. Um, so player comforts are really important part of this process of player enjoyment um, that we're talking about, uh, where you need to make sure that the topics that you're covering in your game aren't legitimately um, horrifying to the people playing uh excuse me yes sorry. sorry about that um legitimately horrifying to the people playing so topics like slavery rape um uh genocide these are topics that aren't gonna be everyone's not gonna be comfortable with um you know it's it's there is a lot of history around these these um these uh, methods of interaction. I, I don't really know what to call them. They, they, it's, it's, it's definitely intense. It's definitely something that's hard to, to do right. Um, if you're a young writer under the, under what, I guess the age of 40, 50 even, even if you're into the, the topic of um, rape is definitely something you don't want to, to get into. It's, it's not something easy to write for. Uh, but, if you want to make sure your players are comfortable with it, that's super important because, and that's why a lot of, um, th that, that has been the case for why some parties have fallen apart. Thankfully, none of that I've been a part of, but I've heard stories of parties have fallen apart because people were uncomfortable with the way that people were playing, uh, the stories that were being presented because of those sort of themes, those sort of topics, that sort of idea of like, my character is very flirtatious and is going to hit on everyone and it makes the DM or one of the other players uncomfortable because uh, one of the party members is constantly like making sex jokes at them or in like derogatory ter like terms that are sexual in nature and it makes them feel like they don't want to be they don't feel welcome anymore i think i think that's the word i was looking for since the beginning the word welcoming um you want people to feel welcome to the table um so that is why uh in part uh, I'm probably never going to have players have, um, intimate relationships with NPCs. Uh, at least not ones that are going to be explicit, um, or detailed. They'll be general and vague at best. Um, it'll be definitely choice based on the matter because you don't, I, I don't know about you, but I don't think the idea of listening to me and Chris flirting at each other for an hour and a half is very fun. Um, for people that are coming for a story about fantasy and, and magic and mystery and all those things, it's in the title. Um, and it just doesn't feel like it's time well spent on things that could be spent on, I guess, things that are fun for you guys to listen to, which is the other added aspect to the, to the game. Um, we're going to, I, I want to talk about that a little bit more, uh, in a second, but the, uh, the yeah the 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 player interactions with npcs you want to make sure that those are there are there is some closeness and that there is friendship fostering between them but uh intimacy is something that i tend tend to not find too uh too neat or neat enough to bring to the table uh consistently it would definitely have to be a very rare and very um, special occasion. Uh, one of my characters, uh, I guess to talk about this, did have uh, an intimate relationship with an NPC, one of my favorite characters to play. He was a, he was like this cowboy. His name is Lance, and he spoke in a cowboy accent. The only reason I was allowed to do that is because my DM made me sit down and like he, he asked me multiple questions in a row and made me talk in paragraphs to see if I could do an accent that consistently and that well, like that it wouldn't get annoying or weird or confusing as to what, what the heck I'm trying to say. Um, and so he let me do that, but he was, he had a relationship with a, with a water elf. A, I forgot what they're called, but it was a water elf or something like that. And it was kind of an off screen sort of romance. Um, and it was a sort of a, a serious relationship and it fit the character. It fit where his story was going, what he needed um, what added to, uh, his experiences and where, where he was and, who, and why. So, but at the same time, remember that was very off screen. Uh, we, we talked about it, but we never actually had those intimate moments 
because that's something that's hard to capture in D and D. It's hard, it's hard to capture at the table with people that are basically doing acting for the first time in their lives. Um, but the uh, so I guess to cut that topic short, um, I wanted to move on to the idea of uh, audience interaction in in this medium. So. The first two episodes, if you guys have been listening since the beginning, I hope you have because it's a cohesive story. You know, you want to be listening every episode to kind of get it. But the uh, the first two episodes were two and a half hours. And the reason for that is that we were still trying to figure out what the, the format would be best suited for you guys listening at home. What that would feel like, what it would be to to have that sort of medium. Is it is it cruel to give you guys an hour of an of a D and D session and then say, come back next week for the next part. Um, for me, I, I, I hated that. I hate short sessions and D and D. I hate short form media. Usually I, I tend to be the, when I did YouTube videos, which is very briefly, um, they tended to be at least they, they were over the 10 minute mark easily every time, because I felt like underneath that it was hard to capture people in a, in a meaningful way. Um, but uh, if I could go back, I would definitely make them hour and a half long episodes at the most uh, because it is definitely challenging to people to listen to something that long. It's definitely it's definitely a, a big ask uh, of us on our part to, 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 get, to say like, hey, take a chance with us for this long to see if you guys like what we're doing enough to listen to the later episodes. Um, and uh, I'm really happy that we switched to the hour long format. And it did change my writing style. So the way it works is that you know, as a DM, you write the whole session. Or if you if you're if you're a DM that plans everything in advance, you write the whole session. You write all the uh, the possibilities and outcomes that you want that could happen, what you want to happen, and the uh, that usually lasts about four hours to five hours per per session of play. Sometimes it can go up to seven hours, depending on how complex and how big your party is and the, the story and all these factors like food and timing and, and what what time of your lives you're in i found that younger players can can definitely play for longer stretches of time before they tire out and experienced players can be the same um it tends to be the middle group that needs kind of the shorter sessions to kind of be able to breathe and you know get themselves and feel adjusted and acquainted um, and I feel like to some degree, a longer session allows play people to kind of warm up, to get into their characters, to get into the groove of things. And then by the end, you have this really solid, consistent play that goes on and it's a lot more polished and it's a lot more true to form of what the, uh, characters are, but sometimes it's hard. Uh, this past week we recorded episodes, um, eight, nine and 10. 8 and 9 were recorded together. It was going to be 8, 9, and 10 all together, but uh, we got exhausted. We, we were just tired, and it, you, we just had to stop. We, sin- and we ended up spending around two and a half hours per recording, which is five hours, which is not a lot of time recording, honestly, d- despite how despite how much of that gets cut out from the, uh, the, the episode. Uh, and how much is chopped down for you guys in the listening experience. And uh, I can, we've explained that before, why we do that. or, But I, I can kind of reiterate that here in a second. Um, the the format of of the of podcasting, this uh, this sort of, this, the, this game, it, it requires changes. It requires a lot of changes to the way that you write, the way that you pace things, the way that you do things. Because... Um, like we said earlier in the very beginning, that we are not using any visual represents, references for anything other than text when it comes to um, us playing this. And even then, I don't show the players anything. The only way we interact in the in uh, episodes is uh, via a voice call. That's it. I don't I don't see them. They don't see me. Nothing. And that's for the sake of making sure that the players are getting the same experience that we are going to be giving to the audience later. It doesn't seem fair that the players would get to see a battle mat and pictures and stuff, even though I did show Stuart a picture in one of the episodes that will be going up after this uh, episode nine, I believe eight. It doesn't matter. You'll, you'll know if he leaves it in, but I showed him a picture, but that was, that was just him. And it was very specific. I, I don't do that normally. 
Um, and uh, yeah, the point of that is that we want to make sure the audience is able to comprehend everything that's going on in a way that's easy. Not that like you guys are stupid or anything. It's it's a lot to take in at any given time. An hour, an hour and a half is a huge chunk of time, but that's good for once a week sort of thing. Like here's your 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 meal for the week. You know, eat it at your leisure, drink, take a sip every day, take 10 minutes every day for the week, or do it all in one go, you know, down it all all at once. Um, and that, that that's how you can digest, digest it. But we need to make sure that that is, we are not overfeeding you guys and in a way wearing ourselves out even further because to write those two and a half hour long sessions, um, it required as much work as any any conjoinment of, of episodes that I would be doing that I did uh, after that um, with less results, honestly. Um, those episodes got a lot less out of them or they were less content rich and dense than the um, later episodes were and to their to their to their fault. Uh, so yeah, if, if you're thinking about doing a DD podcast, uh, try to keep it around an hour and a half at, at most. Now, um, like I said earlier, uh, I am doing, I, compl I know I said I was going to talk about something I probably forgot. I, I can't remember right now. I'm sorry <laughs> if I forgot and you were hoping to hear about something or there was something, there's a topic that I didn't cover for any reason. Uh, I, I promise it wasn't intentional. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, not fill space, but I'm trying to give you as much as uh, my thoughts are able to. Um, so anyway, let's talk about, uh, planning a session. So, um, I have a weird case where, um, if you are playing D and D for the first time, or you're playing with people for the first time, you're probably going to be writing their character sheet for them, at least in 5e and at least, um, to kind of make it a lot easier to swallow. Um, I recommend writing five or six sheets, at least one or two more than the amount of people playing the game and giving them options. Like saying like and show them all the characters and be like here are your options, pick as you as you will and let them kind of decide for themselves. I want to play this. I want to play this. Uh, it lets you write different characters. Make sure that it makes sure that every person is playing a different character. It makes sure that they have something that's actually um, well thought out and written. And it could relate to your story even the way that it's written. Um, I have thoughts for season two that require uh, some character choices that I would need to make sure that are being made um in advance but the uh yeah so you're usually giving them those sheets and it all starts with a document word google drive doc whatever you want to use uh notebook paper grid paper it all starts with that first sheet of paper where you write that one or two line thing where you say what the hell are the players doing what's the story Let's just make one up right now. Let's 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 do this exercise together. So we're making up one right now, right now. and it is a the the players are uh, embarking on a snowy journey to the top of a mountain. That gives you, and why are they doing that? They're going to the top of the mountain to meet a dragon, not fight a dragon. We never said fight there. We'll and we'll say meet. Now, can they fight the dragon? Maybe. That's up to you. As a DM, you have that freedom to decide, do they get to fight this dragon? Is there a situation where they can fight this dragon? Would it be impossible to fight this dragon? Should And if it is, and if it would kill them, try to set up things to prevent them from doing so. Try to make sure your players have a good, a good enough uh, chance to escape death or, or avoid certain death, but don't prevent it entirely. Because it'll just end up making them feel stupid. And it'll make the game feel a lot less natural. Which is kind of the benefit of D&D. So, we have this story. Going to the top of the mountain to meet a dragon. Why are they meeting this dragon? Well, the dragon uh, is uh, a magic wish dragon. They're trying to bring someone back to life. Who are they trying to, back, trying to bring back to life? The king. They're trying to bring back to life the king of their kingdom. So, you have these knights. They're trying to bring back the king. They're going to the top of this mountain. They're meeting this dragon. Who are the knights? Well, we write down the characters or we ask our players, hey, write a character with. And you can when you ask your players to write characters, it is OK to say 
can you try to include this into your background? Now, if you say everyone has to play an orc, everyone is a, a, a barbarian and stuff, that's not necessarily the same thing. You might as well just give them character sheets and say, um, but make sure that's okay with them at first. But like, you might as well write their character sheets for them at that point. Um, uh, I'm saying like, try to weave it into the plot that, for the most part, the the main band. Um, has some connection to the the story of the quest. Now, let's say I say, hey, I want all the characters to be knights. We have five players. All of them have to be knights, or at least most of them, to make the story work. So, what do I do? Well, let's say someone, uh, 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 Jenny brings a character to the table that is not a knight. It's a druid. It's a, a, a barbarian. It's a, a, a ranger. And it's they're from the woods. They're from another city. They're from across the sea. Maybe they were hired along because of um, the party being ill-equipped to handle this on their own. So they hired they hired outside help. You have your hook. Or maybe they also have interest in making sure the king comes back. Maybe they have to speak with him. Maybe they have a connection to one of the other characters. That's something you can decide with the player. That's something you can ask the players to, to work on or to, to speak to them privately about. I could have messaged Jenny in advance. If she didn't, and I didn't know that, I could then say, like, um, all right, Jenny, what is your character? And they tell me their, she tells me her character and we decide how she got involved. Um, or if you want to do the classic bar, just have her be in the tavern. Um, speaking of which, I don't recommend doing the tavern. The reason why it's really, really generic, <laughs> but if it's your first time playing, do it. It's awesome. <laughs> Cause it's your first time playing, might as well. Um, but if you if you've played D and D before, you're playing with people that played D and D before. Try to think of other ways for the party to get together. Try to think of other ways for them to be connected. Um, think of shows like Sense Eight, which has these people. I, I haven't watched it, so I'm talking a little bit out of my butt here. But it has these people linked, like like not physically. They don't know each other, but they are connected. Um, in in this sort of like other way um you could have these people like psychically linked you could have these people spiritually linked you could have these people all worshipers of the same god but from different names that would be that, that that's another way to do it um so one person is praising or uh, a, a follower of talos another person is a follower of odin turns out they're the same dude in whatever world canon that you have and so they've been sent on the same pilgrimage and they end up running into each other. And as they talk, they realize that they're, they're, they're talking about the same guy. It's just that where they come from, he goes by different names. That's it. Um, so you want to set up uh, challenges along the way. So we have our mountain. We have our goal. We have our purpose. We have to set up the things along the way to make sure that challenge feels worthwhile. To make sure that challenge isn't so easily won, that it doesn't take 10 minutes and the party gets back to the bar, fruity drinks out right afterwards, and no big deal. Is the mountain treacherous? Is the mountain booby-trapped? Does the dragon hate visitors? These could all be reasons. Now, you could have um, other travelers along the road that are trying to get a wish themselves, and they're also trying to make sure that people don't get up the mountain. Or there's a, a private expedition up the mountain by another group of uh, not so not so friendly mercenaries who are trying to get their bandit captain's wish, um, which is going to be lots of gold or something. And they are going to be in the way of the party so the party can overcome and defeat them. Um, set up a few things. One, always have a logic challenge. Always have a physical challenge, and always have a mix of both. Finally, have yourself a a challenge that is deceptive, not logical, deceptive. What I mean by that is a red herring challenge. So, um, you could have a a, a group of enemies situated, um, for example, in episode one. Uh, the the guard room 
with all the guards eating lunch in the cafeteria was the red herring room. It was a room that the party did not have to go into. They thought they had to go into it, but they didn't. Um, or, well, one of them did, and the others had to follow. Uh, but they could have ignored that room completely, never fought them. They, uh, and and the, the reason for that is that it makes the dungeon or the, the challenge. By the way, I'm going to use the word dungeon a lot here. Dungeon can revert to anything. A town could be a dungeon. A forest can be a dungeon. Um, that's a family. The the uh, yeah the, the purpose of this is so that you can give your players a, a variety of experiences, make everything feel fresh, and uh, appease all sides. Because some people like riddles, some people don't. Some people like puzzles, some people like problems. Uh, if you are not comfortable in writing your own, there are resources literally everywhere on the internet, in bookstores, uh, comic shops, game shops, everywhere. There are resources willing and ready to help you and people willing and able to help you write your stories, to write your challenges, to write balanced problems for players to solve. People love D&D. Some people do. Some people love D&D. They want other people to see why they love it. So they are going to be willing to help you out if they can. Because they want you to have that same wonderful experience that they've had. Now, should you rely on that? Probably not. You should probably try to make some things uh, your own, on your own. But uh, if you can't, like I said, there are resources out there. You can find riddles online. You can find traps and puzzles online. Literally hundreds of websites have been dedicated to the idea of dungeons and dragons idea puzzle ideas um and the last thing that you would do is uh give them rewards along the way give them uh maybe one or two small rewards and then one large reward at the end um give them some rest a, a moment of reprieve in between something to give them a chance to take a breath or to, to relax that can sometimes be the, the town before the dungeon. Sometimes that can be just a room in the dungeon that is literally made to be that way. Or not. Maybe it's enough to get a breather, enough to have a conversation, but not enough to sit down and actually rest. Um, and that could be the idea. Maybe it, it adds to the sort of treacher, treacherous nature of where they are traveling or where they're traveling to. By the way, just because we said that they're going to be on a snowy mountain doesn't mean they have to be outside. They could be inside the mountain at all times and then come out at the very end or be outside at all times and then go inside at the very end. Obviously, I'm going to reckon go staying inside if you're new to D&D. It makes it a lot less complicated if you have a room, like a, like physical restrictions as to where they are. Um, but, uh, yeah. Another thing, if you're playing in person. Have a grid, like have a little, like a, like a grid thing to track combat with so that the players and you can easily see where everything is. Something you're able to draw out the room space on. If you, there are these cool, like dry erase uh, mats that you can get that have like a grid on them. And then you can draw the, the shape of the room and you're like, all right, place your units in there and stuff like that. And that's how you keep track of, of uh, distance. A lot of the distance tracking I have to do has to be on the fly in my head or written down on notebook paper. It is not fun. It is difficult. Is it accurate? No. Half the time, it's not accurate. And I promise, if you look, listen, you'd probably find some of my inconsistencies. And they're pretty bad. They're pretty rough. They're pretty, like, moment-ruining. But um, – you're not limited to that in an in a in person setting and even on an online person uh, online setting there is a roll20.net which is a fantastic resource if you're trying to play online with friends that live in other states or other countries um you can you can have your little figurines on there and it has a, a grid system built into the way it tracks things and you can roll dice on there if you don't have dice um it, it, it gives a lot of a lot of ease of mind to new people playing the game um, so what kind of treasures do we give players? Magic items seem like the first most obvious choice. I always err on the side of give them something that might be useful, but isn't always useful. Give them something weird. Give them something strange. I like the idea of a magical world where people made weird things and then just left them. 
One of my favorite items is um, a necklace that lets you know if it's raining, but it can only work outside and within one mile of the source of the rain. So basically, it lets you know if it's raining if you're in rain. That's funny. But what that can mean is, what if they're in a challenge where they're outside and um, it's raining and then all of a sudden the rain stops and they're in this weird sort of like fog and they're surrounded by skeletons and stuff and one of them rolls, one of the players rolls a perception or an arcane check and then you hint that the necklace is still glowing. The necklace is still reacting. Suddenly now you've given them a hint that this isn't real, that they're in an illusion of some sort. And now you've given this weird mundane item that's crappy that your player decided to keep wearing because it's funny an actual purpose. And that's way cooler than the idea of a magic short sword that shoots lightning bolts because, well, it shoots lightning bolts. I mean, it's, it, that's, it, that is the beginning and end of the excitement there. Weird, weird mundane items that could be useless entirely or are very specific or even semi-specific but are powerful when they are used in that way, I think make for a lot more interesting interactions in the game world. Um, as you'll see in the next couple of episodes, I introduced a magic shop where uh, I got to introduce some of my, of my new favorite toys that I've invented. And I like to think of it like toys because it's stuff that if I, if I was a player and these were items introduced, I would really want to get my hands on them because they seem like a lot of fun. Uh, I, <laughs> I introduced... One in particular to my roommate, and I think I mentioned in the episode, but I don't know if it's going to be in there. Uh, he spent the, the next week and a half just coming up with and messaging me different ideas of how you could use it to do weird things like murder people or to 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 like perform like cool magic tricks or things like that or just do funny things. Um, and that's that's kind of what you get. Uh, also, know, know, the, the, know the personality of your players. It's kind of a big one that kind of is coming out of nowhere. Know what kind of players you're playing with. Are your players likely to call your 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 characters um, Dick McFarts a lot, or are they going to call him Ulthras, the the fourth savior of the realm of Highland? What are what what kind of people are you playing with? Are, are do they like jokes? Do they like do they like stories? Do they like combat? Like what are they looking for in the game? What are they going to bring to the table? You you should ask these things. Um, like, Hey guys, what do you want out of a game? Like that should be a question you actually ask your players. Like, do they want something that's combat heavy? Do they want something that's puzzle heavy? Do they want something that's funny? Do they want something that's serious? Simply put with just those, those two different questions, like those two, this or that, um, you can get a lot of good information out of your players. I've gotten a lot of good ideas out of players because I've asked them questions after the fact. I've asked them questions before I even started writing the campaign. Um, I'll often take a day or two before I even put the pencil on the paper when it comes to writing these stories, even if I have a really good idea, because what if I have a better one or what if, um, I get so caught up in this idea that I then don't accept any possible variation. Now, I'm not saying that that sort of paranoia is healthy. I'm saying that that sort of, um, relaxed sort of like accepting that you might have another idea that's okay, that's better or just as good makes you less um l less um obligated to your idea despite having having it first so mundane weapons gold is a big one uh i'll let you know now uh 5e is not made for a magic environment or it is but it's not made for magical items 5e was really big on the fact that um in 3.5 in pathfinder uh magic items were the go-to method for players to power up because once you hit a certain number of levels, it gets weird to keep leveling you up. Once you hit like level 16 in the game, you pretty much stop leveling. Because at that point, you just, after that, you start becoming like too powerful. Or you become so powerful that you start fighting things. It is only in a way for, uh, sorry, you start fighting things <laughs> that you can only fight because you're at that level. Um, you start being able to fight really cool monsters because you're finally able to meet their challenge. 
And that's the, I guess, the point of it. So to make people players feel powerful, people give them magic items. So they feel unique, so that there's a lot more personality the way they're able to play themselves. So not every monk is the same monk when they reach level 20 because one monk has magical bracers, one has a a, st- a talking stick, the other one has little fairy wings on his boots, and the last one has a helmet that can see through t- metal, but not anything else. I don't know, just cool weird things that they can do. Now in like I said, in Pathfinder 3.5, mostly Pathfinder as far as I know, because I didn't really play 3.5, um, the the problem was is that players would have an extra sheet where they had nine magical items all attuned to their player or character because that's what the DM just had to start doing to compensate. Five, uh, 5e was a severe departure away from that, a world where magical items are weird and rare. To the point that it's like if you finding a magic shop is weird, finding a finding a um, like a like a super powered magic shop even weirder. Um, there is no price for potions in D anD D five e because potions aren't sold; they're just not in five e in the base game. Now you're asking yourself, but Adam, I've listened to your show, or I think you have. Adam, I've heard you talk about this. I've heard you give prices out. Where do you make these numbers from? Honestly, it comes from experience. It just comes from, I think this is a good price. I'll go with it. If it starts to be a problem, you change that price. Market can inflate and deflate as needed. Um, that's realistic. And we have that advantage on our side in terms of realism in uh, a fantasy game. So, I guess a, a good sort of uh, number is... Uh, Potions around like 35G for a D6, 50G for a D8, um, and then 500 and up at least for every magical item. 1,000 to 2,000 for ones that are super powerful, and 5,000 and up for things that are like legendary status. Like things that are like, this is the sword that killed a man who, who became a god or something. I don't know. This is the this is the spear that killed Achilles. That would be a legendary item that would cost five thousand gold, and it could probably make you fly. And also shoot lasers out of your eyes or something. Um, but the 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 I guess the the cautionary urge is do not give magical items like candy, at least not ones that are strong, because it'll get ridiculous really quick, and you'll end up with a Pathfinder scenario. Uh. Also, make sure that there's enough for everyone, or at least have an idea of, okay, if this player takes this and this player takes this, then they'll all take this much gold, or some distribution, so every player... You don't want someone finishing the fight or getting to the treasure room, and everyone's like, oh, cool, and everyone picks out something cool and shiny and new, and then there's one guy who's like, hey, wait, but there's nothing left for me. And suddenly they have to spend another 15 minutes figuring out how they would even distribute four items amongst five people. Or four items and no gold amongst five people. Usually the way it works is four people take the items, one person takes the gold, or they split it to some degree to like, like someone's like, I'll take two shares of the gold so that you get, but I won't take an item. And I've seen people do that, and that's kind of how people decide to split the stuff up. Also, don't be that player that just takes all the gold for themselves, or just... I might do a whole other thing on this one, but don't be a player that's a, don't be a dick. Just don't be a dick at the table. Nobody wants that. Just don't play if you're going to be a dick at the table. Pretend to like the other party members or find a way to like the other party members or talk to them about making sure your characters can like each other because the paladin and the anti-paladin cannot be on the same party. They just can't. They have to kill each other. You can, I mean, you could write a way for them to not have to kill each other. You could make it so that there's like a common enemy to both of them. But at the same time, you have to give them that sort of common ground. You can't just expect them to go traveling together and fight dragons because, well, I said so because I'm the player. Because at, at that point, you're just acting out of like, out of character, and it's like a whole thing um, that your DM could punish you for. And rightfully so, because you're not playing the game right. <laughs> and what are games without rules? And what are rules if not for to be broken? If not to be broken? But anyway, um, 
I hope this was helpful at all, and I hope this makes up for the fact that we're not going to have a full episode this week. Uh, this is probably going to be around 30 minutes long. But uh, I hope you have a wonderful week. From all of us at Arcane Mystery Tour, stay safe, stay dry. Stay, stay dry. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll see you again next week for episode 8.